Step 4. Multiplexing concepts. In lesson 7 on types of networks, we talked about multiple, sometimes competing connections in networks. That's exactly what we're going to explore further in this step. So this basic situation that we have in mind is a network and a multiple users that are trying to establish connections. And there are no dedicated connections between each possible combination of those users. Therefore, the users must make use of um, the network uh, resources in a sort of simultaneous way. And the network has to figure out how to share those resources and satisfy the needs uh, of those users in a fair way. So we would like to share a network. How do we do it? First, we're going to think about what's different and what's harder about quantum networking when compared to classical networking. Classical networking is all about forwarding packets. On the other hand, quantum networking is more like a distributed computation. We have nodes, they are trying to cooperate, they are trying to purify their bell pairs, or they are trying to swap and in, uh, create entanglement between longer distance nodes. That means that the connections are stateful. Each node must know the state of the connection, um, uh, whether the qubit is connected with its neighbor or somebody else down the connection. Also, we have to deal with low success probability in links. Even when things are ideal and without noise, just trying to interfere two photons at a BSA um, can happen only with maximum success probability of 50%. Also, we have to deal with high dwell times on qubits. Dwell times means that the qubit is reserved or it's locked, it's part of some connection. And we have to do this despite the fact that we are dealing with very limited memory lifetimes. The qubits themselves, they decor here very quickly. Yet, we have to reserve them in order to send and receive message, classical messages. This means that long connections behave very differently from short ones. All of these problems relate to 1G repeater networks only, which is mostly what we are going to talk about in this module and particularly in this step. So what is multiplexing? How do we share quantum network or even a classical network? Well, number one, there are multiple users that are trying to make use of the network's resources and we would like to assign those resources on a, very, on a particularly fair basis. We're going to assume that we give no priority for some conversation over the others. That means all conversations are treated equally. So the question now is, how do we mathematically define what fairness means? And for that matter, we also need to figure out what do we want to share. Let's start with the fairness index. Here's Jane's fairness index. So after the network um, um, achieves some task, for example, distributes bell pairs between uh, connections x1, x2, up to xn, we would like to know how fair was that distributed computation. And that can be qualified by Jane's Fairnex index. Over here at the top, we've got the square of the sum of the work that was achieved by connection xi. And at the bottom, we've got the sum of the squares of these connections and renormalized by uh, the number of connections. And naturally, high fairness means is it better. It means that the network shared those resources in a more fair way. For example, if we have n connections and we assign for every connection 1 over n of the bandwidth, then the Jane's fairness index is equal to 1, as we can um, check by substituting back in. Over here at the top, we will have n times 1 over n, which is equal to 1, and 1 squared is 1. And at the bottom, we have n times 1 over n squared times n, which is also 1. On the other hand, if one connection gets everything and everybody else gets nothing, then j will be equal to 1 over n. So, let's now turn to the question of what we are trying to share. Any of the following things can be subdivided. We can subdivide space. We will show you how it's done with free space or how it can be done in a conductor or optical fiber in a network. We can also subdivide time. And we can do it deterministically or we can do it stochastically. 
we can also subdivide frequency or wavelength. And we can also subdivide computational resources, such as buffer memories uh, inside uh, our quantum nodes. And we can, in fact, even subdivide mathematics, which is done in CDMA for mobile phones, or code division multiple access. Let's look at all of these categories one by one. How do we share space? Imagine that we have a city represented by these six hexagons, and we're trying to cover its area with cellular signal. One way of doing it is we could build a very large, powerful cellular tower in the middle. Or we can divide the free space uh, of the city into smaller hexagons and build smaller towers responsible for covering only their own uh, hexagons. And it turns out that subdividing the city into smaller parts and covering each one with its own uh, cellular tower is much better. Also, we are sharing space when we are using photons to carry information. Imagine photons traveling from this laser into this detector and from this laser into this detector. The two beams are crossing, but because photons don't really interact, we are trivially sharing space. We can also talk about sharing space inside a network. Let's go back to our example of a network that we uh, have been using in this uh, lesson so far. And we have a connection between A and B going through D. We've got a blue connection between F and G, and we've got a green connection between C and E. None of these connections cross, so they can be used at the same time. Now, let's talk about sharing time. One way of sharing time is to use circuit switching. And this is when we dedicate the use of all resources on the path until they are released. For example, if A is trying to establish an entangled pair with E, then all of these links and all of the bell pairs generated uh, at this link level are dedicated just to satisfy the connection request between A and E until they decide that they are done. Then those resources will be released and can be used for other connections in the network. On the other hand, the D and B, because they are not really trying to make resources um, uh, that are dedicated to A and E, can also um, satisfy their request. But it also means that if C is trying to talk to B, and its routing table tells it that the best way to do it is to uh, go through F and G until it, we reach B, then the, uh, C cannot do that because the connection that's between A and E is using the link FG, which C would also like to use. So C has to wait until that connection is released. A different way of sharing time uh, is to use time division multiplexing, or TDM. And this is uh, when we take turns based on a fixed length of time slots. For example, 100 milliseconds each. So in the first 100 millisecond time slot, we satisfy the connection request between A and E. Then in the second 100 millisecond time slot, we switch to satisfy the request between C and B. And then we switch back to satisfy the request between A and E. So for all the odd number of time slots, we are uh, taking care of the connection between A and E. And for the even number time slots, we are taking care of the connection between C and B. The question arises though, if we are in one of the odd time slots, what is C doing? In fact, what is the link CF doing? If we are in the even number time slots, what is the connection AF doing? A different way of um, the sharing time is called statistical multiplexing. And this uh, addresses our question from the previous slide. Now there are no fixed time slots and channel use is uh, uncontrolled and even random. And this is how the internet, how the classical internet works uh, most of the time. But we have to be very careful when we use statistical multiplexing in quantum networks. Imagine that F uh, swaps one end of an FG bell pair for the CB connection. So F is trying to establish an entanglement between CG such that then G can swap and C and B can share a bell state. But G doesn't do this. It in fact swaps uh, bell pairs that are dedicated to the A and E connection. 
This is a problem that we must address in quantum computing and quantum networking. Also, that we can share frequency, as we said at the beginning of this step. This is called wavelength multiplexing, and it uses the fact that the fiber can carry independent signals on separate wavelengths, here represented by these two different colors, green and blue. So this allows the two connections A to E and C to B to be satisfied at the same time by using wavelength multiplexing on the FG link. But it also presents a challenge. The signal that's coming out of the fiber at G must be separated by a filter in order to split the channels that are dedicated for B and dedicated for E. This presents a quite a large technical problem because we're not sending two classical uh, signals all the time. Sometimes we want to mix a classical signal and a quantum signal. Quantum signals are usually at the order of single photons, whereas classical signals contain vast number of photons, meaning that even if we have a very small overlap between the two signals uh, that are traveling down the fiber, the quantum signal will get completely over overwhelmed by the classical signal. And also, uh, quantum memories are quite finicky. They require very narrow wavelength bandwidth uh, at which they operate. So we must ensure that we are using compatible memories for each node. Now, how do we share uh, computational resources? This is known as buffer space multiplexing. And this is where memories in repeaters can be assigned for the exclusive use of particular connection. For example, the node in our quantum network here, node F, could have the following set of qubits. We could assign or dedicate these blue qubits to the blue connection between A to E, and we can uh, assign the rest uh, of the qubits, and denoted by these green qubits, to the green connection C to B. This, on the other hand, is an extremely challenging task. Also, a very uh, uh, fundamental concept in multiplexing is that of a quality of service, and in particular, hard quality of service versus soft quality of service. We talked about stat maxing or statistical multiplexing, that it has no reservation and it only works on the best effort uh, principle. This is how internet works. On the other hand, when we use circuit um, circuit switching and sharing resources in that way. This is known as hard quality of service reservation. This is when we dedicate a, uh, um, the resources of a network along a path to a particular connection. Uh, those two users, their needs are satisfied. They can share high bandwidth connection. But all of the other users in the network have to wait until that connection is freed. So other connections are blocked from using resources of the network, and this is not particularly fair. Also, we are presented with the problem of how do we charge for the use? Do we charge uh, based on how many bell pairs do we uh, consume, or on the total time that we use for a connection? We can learn a lot of lessons from the telephony model from uh, over 100 years ago. Also, um, we must realize that quality of service was a particularly big topic in classical networking, classical internet in the 1990s. Should we use hard quality of service or soft quality of service? Or should we use integrated services versus differentiated services? That debate has raged on over 30 years ago. And most likely, it will be very important in the context of, classic, of quantum internet as well. This concludes our step on the basic concepts of multiplexing.